Liz Paul Campbell from the Atheist. Liz Paul Campbell from uh from um Okay, it's recording. Liz Paul Campbell. And uh I am an atheist Christian. And I'm basically making Christian content in the style of Christianity. Not against it because majority of atheists like Forrest Volonsky, J. Mike, Matt Duwenty, Aaron Raw, Christy Berkey, other atheist apologetics. These people, for example, you know, you know, um, they are pro trans, pro choice politicians. They don't care about biblical truth. All they care about is money and power. So this is when we will be debunking Christy Berkey. That's her name, Christy Berkey. I think it's kind of like says it's kind of a cool name, but I'll debunk her. I'll see what she has to say. All of the things we were taught not to question. Shit. Baptist Church, and I was a Christian until my early 20s when I deconstructed everything I knew about my faith and about my reality, and I set off on a journey to find truth. It is now... To find truth. All been 13 plus years later, I have not found the ultimate truth, but I think that's the point. I think the point is to get to a Jesus. point where you become comfortable just saying, I don't know. I don't know what's beyond this. I don't know who God is. I don't... And friend and I, when I was 17 years old, you will say to me, play my power in verse 16. It does not, therefore, no way that God created people just to go to hell. And then I read Romans 9. Okay. So she, like any other Christian and atheist apologetic, sorry, anti theist apologetic, these, uh, they're going to take the Bible out of context. She does that too. So that's, uh, let's go read what she has to say. Starting in verse 16. It does not, therefore, depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. God has murder uses and some for common use. What if God, although cho choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his on for God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden not exactly see God hardens the hearts of people if you read the book of Exodus about the story of the Pharaoh God hardens the hearts of people because one is that people are prideful people are full of shit and the Christian God does that is because to show him his power. God doesn't harden people's hearts. He doesn't do that. If you read the Bible as a whole, God said to Moses that I'm going to harden his heart every time I show my power. See, pharaohs back in the day, even kings and rulers back in the day, view themselves as gods back then. And God warned them that if you do, if you do this, if you don't do this, I'm going to do something that's bad and you will not like it. So what the people respond is that they chose to just, you know, ignore God's plea. And the more God showed them the people's power, the more hearts get hardened now more than because the hardened heart talks about the pride of man. That's what's talking about. So let's read the book of Romans chapter nine. Let's read chapter nine as a whole to get where the point is. is. And it says this oh shit. Chapter 9. <laughs> Oops, I'm sorry. As I say through in Christ, I lie not. My conscience is bearing witness with the Holy Ghost, that I may heaviness and constitutional sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ, from my brethren, with my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises. Five, verse 5. Whose are the fathers into, of whom are concerning the flesh Christ came, who is all over God blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel, neither because 
bear the seed of Abraham, all their are all they they are all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is they which are the children of the flesh, these are not of the children of God, but the children of the promise to be counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise, that at this time I will come, Sarah shall have a son. To verse 10, not only this, but when Rebekah also had, con had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. For the children being not yet born, neither having they have done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand not of works, but of him that calleth. It is it was said to her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith with Moses, I will have mercy of whom I will have mercy, I have compassion whom I have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. But the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I shall shew my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, whom he will be hardeth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath raised resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou repliest against God? Shall the thing form say to him, What formed it? Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter's power over the clay, over the lump of the, um, to make one vessel unto honor, and another to dishonor? What if God willing to shew his wrath, and that his power, no, endureth much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to the destruction, and that he might have known the riches of his glory, and on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Even us, whom he called, not of the Jews only, but of the Gentiles, as he saith also, as he saith also in O.C., I will call them my people, which are not my people, her beloved, which has not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it said unto them, Ye are not my people, people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Asasas also cried concerning Israel, through the number of the children of Israel, be as the sand of the sea. A remnant shall be saved, for he will be for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. Neither. Righteousness. Because of a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Asis said before, except the Lord of the Sabbath, of the Sabbath, had left us a seed. He had been as Sodom and had been made unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which follow not of righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even as righteousness which is of the faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained the law of righteousness. Wherefore, thou then may so with unto by faith. But it is were by the works of the law, for they stumbled into stubble stone. As written, Behold, I lay in soin, 
a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. And whoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So Apostle Paul, when and if you look at the beginning of the I'm sorry that my, my uh, reading is, doesn't sound good. My, my apologies, but if you read the beginning of the book of Romans, chapter one, up to the verse, um, verse thirteen, it talks about it talks about a rhetorical sense that God in Christianity, right? Um, I'm not a scholar. I'm not. I'm not qualified to talk about this, but my best. I think it was talking about about what God did in the Old Testament and what He's going to do. I think it was. Ta I think Apostle Paul's talking about that God's going to forge a new covenant for the people of Israel for pe for all people to gain salvation, because some people right rebel against God day in and day out. So. Apostle Paul is saying that despite our rebellion, God still loves us. But why would say that God hardens our hearts? Well, God does not, you know, manipulate your emotions. See, God hardens the hearts of people because people have pride. The Pharaoh has pride in Egypt. God said to Moses, I will harden his heart every time I show my power onto Egypt. See, God said to Moses, I'm going to harden his heart every time I show my power. Because Pharaohs back in, back in Moses' time view themselves as gods, right? People have a God complex. Those who have a God complex, have a prideful complex, will have a hardened heart. So God doesn't harden the hearts like, like outright. He does that every time he shows them his power. If I said no to God, right? I don't believe God is real, but I, if I say no to God and, and God should know that it's terrible, it's not as bad, right? That was going to happen, what's going to take place. And I'll say no. And I'll say, why would you say that, Paul? Because, I don't know why, I got a God complex. So God hardens the hearts of people for those who have a God-like complex. That's what God does. Right? And God shows mercy to those who are willing to be humble. So I think when God talks about he hardens the hearts, the hardening of the heart symbolizes the pride of man. Right? The pride of man. Okay, the hardening of the heart symbolizes the pride of man. God hardens the hearts of people to show pride, but God shows mercy to those who are willing to, to, to repent and be humble. Because God shows mercy to those who are humble, those who knew who are messed up, right? Who knew are not good, right? So God hardens the hearts of people who show pride, and God hearts, God shows mercy to those who are humble. So God does not physically harden your heart. God hardens your heart by showing you the dark reality. If you make the wrong decisions in life, God's going to show you the consequence of what you're going to do. And if your pride gets a hold of you, that's when God hardens your heart because you don't want to listen to God's plea. But if you show humility and show repentance of what you've, been, what you've, what you've done in your life, God shows mercy on you and God shows forgiveness upon you because the Bible says, God is faithful and God's long suffering. God forgives. So God isn't vindictive. So, so what Christy Burke could get wrong is that she thinks that God hardens people's heart. Well, God does that. Yeah. Why? Because people are prideful. If you're prideful, God's going to harden your heart by showing, by showing you, by, by him showing you his power. If I say no to God, God's going to show me the consequence of of my actions. God's going to show me the consequence of what's going to happen and if I still keep on saying no. No, God's going to keep on showing me. And that's where the hardening of the heart takes place. Because the hardening of the heart means the pride of man. Right? The pride of humanity because pride holds you back. Pride hardens you into a monster and something that you're not. God does not harden your heart. He doesn't do that. But God does that every time he shows you his power. The Pharaoh, God not harden Pharaoh's heart. Okay, God not do that. It's because um, God not 
harden the Pharaoh's heart is because, well, you know, people show pride. People are prideful and vindictive in their actions and their thoughts. The Pharaoh is prideful. And God hardened his heart every time God showed the Pharaoh his power. So God does not harden people's hearts outright. God gives you a command. If you disobey his command, God's going to show you the consequences. And your heart will harden, which is the pride of man. So the hardening the heart embodies the pride of man, of man's pride and ambition that will get them killed. So God hardens people's hearts. He does that by showing them the power or the consequences of what will happen if they keep making the bad decisions. God showed the Pharaoh of what's going to happen if he keep on disobeying his command. God kept on showing the Pharaoh that he's not in charge of the universe, God is. The Pharaoh's not in charge of the, of the universe, God is. You see, God's in charge of all things. God's in charge of the universe, okay? And God hardens the Pharaoh's heart because the Pharaoh's heart is prideful. God not harden his heart before these things happen. God said to Moses, I will harden his heart every time he says no. When he says no, God's going to harden his heart. And how's God going to harden his heart? God's going to do that by showing the Pharaoh God's power. God hardens the Pharaoh's heart by showing him his power, showing him the consequences of what's going to happen. By showing the Pharaoh through his godlike complex, like any man or woman who has a godlike complex, to show these people that they're not in charge, God is. God is in charge of all things, not man. And God hardens the hearts of the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh, because one, he does that shit to what? Why would God do that? God did that by showing the Pharaoh his power, by showing the Pharaoh through his prideful eyes that he's not in charge. Charge. So the hardening of the heart embodies the pride of man. God shows mercy because why? And why is the Bible says that God shows mercy to whom he'll show mercy? Well, it says because he does that. Why? Because, because of humility. If you show humility and let go of your own pride, then God will not harden your heart and God will show you mercy and forgiveness. And that's what happens, right? People are so self-righteous and so high and mighty that they're willing to, that God will harden their heart because why? They don't want to look at God's glory. They want to look at the humility and righteousness and love of God. So what did God do? God hardens hearts of people because why? People are prideful. So the hardening of the heart embodies the pride of man. Let's get to the point. To a point. When Christians talk about you have a hardened heart against God, the Bible says that God's the one that hardened it. Yeah, God hardens the hearts because people are prideful. God, God, right, in the Bible, he hardened the Pharaoh's heart by showing the Pharaoh his power. The Pharaoh, Pharaoh, like any other ruler or any other person, have a has a God-like complex. And God hardens the heart of these people because, one, they're prideful. And God shows these people the consequences of their actions if they keep making the wrong decisions. So God does not harden your heart outright. He hardens it every time when he shows you what's going to happen. He shows the person that he's, he's not in charge. God is in charge. God made the universe. God does what he wills. And God hardens the hearts of people and why would he do that? It's because people are prideful. People are so self-righteous and vindictive that they're willing to manipulate and murder their own children for the sake of realities. The Pharaoh in the Bible, he's prideful. He's prideful of his work. He's prideful of everything he had. So God does not harden your heart outright he hardens it by showing you the consequences of of what your actions are and what you're doing so so yeah god hardens the hearts of people why 
because of hearts of people is because people are prideful. That's the reality. And then it, it even goes on to ask, well, then why does God still blame us? You know? Because God, because we're prideful. The hardening of the heart embodies the pride of man. God hardens the heart of the Pharaoh every time he shows the Pharaoh his power. God shows the Pharaoh what he's capable of doing if he keeps on saying no. And the Pharaoh's pride does not let him. And that's when God hearts the heart. God lets the heart go for his own desires. Because the heart in the heart embodies letting the heart go to their own wicked desires. That's what God said that I will harden his heart. How? By showing him his power. By showing his wonders. God said to Moses that, that the Pharaoh say no. And God said I will harden his heart. To do what? To show him his power. To show him the consequences for what happened. No, if, if he created this way, how come he blames us? And Paul is saying, who are you to question God? How can the clay question the potter and ask, why have you made me like this? It says, what if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? If he has decided he wants to create you just to destroy you, then he's going to do that. He doesn't do that, bro. God is not created to destroy you because the Bible says that we're predestined unto glory and majesty. The Bible says that the Christian God embodies humans to to be to be part of glory and majesty. That's what the Bible says, right? But due to the heart of the heart and the pride of man, the pride of life, who wanted to be like God, right? Because Lucifer in the Bible rebelled against God because he was prideful. His heart got hardened and God showed Lucifer the consequences, what's going to happen. And due to Lucifer hardening his own heart, you know what I'm saying? God, you know, destroyed Lucifer. God destroyed Ramses the Pharaoh because the Pharaoh was prideful. God does not harden your heart. He does that while he shows power to you. And that's his right. You don't get to question that. And realizing this, I, the second passage that really caused me to question the Bible was Psalm 137.9. And you You've probably heard it. It's a popular one that is used within the deconstruction community to really talk about these atrocities in the Bible. And it says this. Now take that, crazy take that. No. Happy is the one. Um, it is praying these into rocks. They just, you know, wanted justice. They wanted revenge. But my problem with that is that this is supposed to be the inspired word of God. Yeah, it was not. Yeah, the reason why the Bible is the inspired word of God because, because the Bible tells the truth by the human condition like anybody else. See, if you read the book of Psalms, chapter 137, as a, as a whole, right? It says, by the rivers of Babylon that we are sat down, yea, what we wept when we remembered Zion, we hanged our harps upon the wills of the midst thereof, for therefore they shall carry us away to captive and required us a song that they would wasted us and required us mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion's. How shall we sing the Lord's song in strange land? If I forgot thee, O Jerusalem. Let my right hand be forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the house of Jerusalem. What, who, what, who raised, raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that that taketh the dashes of thy little ones against the stones. So, so this passage talks about Israel's anger towards 
Babylon. And Israel wanted revenge against what Babylon did to them, right? Babel, hell, if you look at the, the, the story of, of how Babylon conquered, uh, how Babylon, you know, uh, conquered um, Israel, it was a complete slaughter. Men, women, children died. Babies died. And Israel was so angry about this, they want to do the same thing to Babylon. See, and she asked that, why would God allow that to be written over there? Because God, right, wants humans to know about the human condition, the, the nature of mankind. Of if you, look, if you live in a dangerous situation where your loved ones are killed, you want to, 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 to kill the person and do terrible things to them. And the Bible talks about the human condition better than anybody else. And that's the reality. It talks about the human condition of how humans are capable of doing things. And the Bible is the inspired word of God because it tells the truth about the dark nature of humanity. If you read the um, AI chat, right? AI chat that I uh, got called chat gen. Right? It talks about... Um, About this and the AI says Psalms 137 verse 9 verse 1 through 9 is a passage from the book of Psalms and the Bible expresses the sorrow and longing of the Israelites who were taken captive and, exi and exiled in Babylon the psalmist reflects on their pain and desire to remember their homeland Jerusalem in verse 1 the psalmist describes the scene by the rivers of Babylon which they sat down wept remembered Zion Jerusalem and they were filled with sadness and longing with their homeland in verse 2 they hung their harps upon the willows and symbolizing their loss of joy in music. They were unable to find comfort or joy in their current situation. Verse 3 mentions how their captors demand them to sing songs of Zion, mocking their pain and a asking for entertainment. The psalmist questions how they sing the Lord's song in a foreign land where they're oppressed and far from their true home. In verse 5 and 6, the psalmist expressed their commitment to never forget Jerusalem. They declare if they forgot, they would rather lose their skills and abilities, right hand forget her cunning, or be unable to speak their tongue to cleave to the roof of my mouth. Jerusalem is valued above all else, even their chief joy. In verse 7, the psalmist calls upon the Lord to remember the actions of the Edomites, who rejoiced in destruction of Jerusalem. They ask God to take note of the enemy's actions and hold them accountable. Verse 8 expresses a desire for Babylon, representing as the daughter of Babylon to be destroyed. And the psalmist wishes for those who oppress them receive the same treatment they have received. So, and lastly, in verse 9, the psalmist expressed a harsh sentiment towards the destruction of Babylon's children. The verse reflects the intense emotions and desire for justice felt by the psalmist, but it's important to interpret it within the context of the psalm and the historical situation rather than its commanded or endorsement of violence. So this is AI talking about the passage of the Bible. So yeah, this is, this is kind of good. This is really good. Because if you look in Babylon, Babylon killed the Israelites and there was a complete slaughter. And Israel wanted to, wanted to do the same to the Babylonians, right? Israel wanted the Babylonians to receive the same treatment that the Babylonians did to Israel, right? That's what it's, it's talking about. And the question that she raises is that why would God allow this to be in the Bible because the Bible talks about the human condition of human suffering and the Bible talks about the pride of man and the wickedness of all mankind the reason why as an atheist I think that the Bible is the inspired word of God is because it talks about the dark nature of mankind or what humans are capable of doing it talks about that in the Bible all the time and on top of that it understands the human condition more than anybody else. So, yeah, God did not order that 
if you read the if you read the context of the psalm itself, it talks about you know about what Israel want to do to the Babylonians. So the Babylonians they invade Israel and they kill the men, the women, the children, and all the other innocent people in Israel, right? And the people of Israel wanted Babylon to receive the same treatment like the bashing of innocent babies and stuff and children and shit. The Babylonians did it to Israel and the Israelites wanted the Babylonians to receive the same treatment that they received. You know what I'm saying? I like what the AI says that that lastly in verse 9, the psalmist expressed a harsh sentiment wishing for the destruction of Babylonians' children. And this verse reflects some intense emotions and desire for just felt by the psalmist. But it's important to interpret it within the context of the psalm and the stroke situation rather than its command or endorsement of violence. This is AI talking about this, okay? This AI. AI. So, yeah, the Bible talks about the nature of the human condition, talks about the dark nature of humanity. It talks about it all the time, man, and it's kind of good. Let's get to our point again. God is supposed to be inspiring every word of this book. And God never condemned them for praying this prayer. They didn't, they didn't pray the prayer. If you, read, if you read this psalm in context, Christy, it's not a prayer. Psalms are just songs of emotions and pathos and stuff and all kinds of stuff, right? Like there was no prayer in in the in the book of Psalms, chapter one thirty seven. I don't see it there. And on top of that, it's talking. I mean, it's talking about Israel. Is if you read the context of it, what AI talks about. copy the clipboard right the AI was talking about you know what I'm saying AI was talking about you know about about Israel wanting to repay the same treatment that that the Babylon did Babylon killed babies Babylon killed the women and children of Israel and the men and the Israelites want to repay the Babylonians with that same treatment, right? They didn't pray for that to happen. They, they, they didn't pray to God for that to happen. They just they're, just, they're just angry about it. But what happened to them? They want to, they want people to receive the same treatment. See, if you look at uh, Junji Ito's uh, book about, Junji Ito, he's a Japanese uh, manga artist. He talks about, um, there was that, there was that, book called um i forgot what it's called but man i forgot what it's called but it talked about the people of japan going apeshit crazy trying to kill a, a hollywood star actress for summoning a planet that's going to kill them all see when humans right when they deal with harsh situations when humans have suffered injustice and and all kinds of fucked up shit, right? Humans want to repay humanity in that return, right? The book of Psalms talks about the dark nature of humanity, right? Even, even, even like, uh, like in The Walking Dead, right? The Walking Dead not only participates that zombies are scary, but humans are more scary than the zombies because humans, if they had to deal with a zombie apocalypse majority of humans would not act rationally because when when survival and anger and emotions kick in rationality and logic goes out the window you know what i'm saying when you know what i'm saying israel had to, had had to, israel right the nation of israel want to deal with the same treatment right they want to deal they want to to deal with the same treatment as the um as Babylonians did to them, right? So I do feel sorry for Israel. Right? So Psalm, it's not a prayer to God. It's just, you know, it's just Israel's expressing their anger and emotions towards the Babylonians what they did to them. So yeah. Let's get to her point what she's trying to say. He never said, Hey, don't don't think that way. 
don't don't be so vengeful. Yeah, because God does not control people what they can and cannot do. God hardens hearts of people because one, he does that by showing humanity his power. See, the hardening of the heart, right, it's not about God hardening your heart before you do something. God hardens your heart because of your own pride, because of your own vindictiveness. The Pharaoh's prideful. People are prideful. God hardens the heart because why? Pride of man. And second, let's, let's get to the point. Right? Let's get to her, uh, her, uh, her point, what she's trying to say. Is that, why wouldn't God tell them that, that, hey, you shouldn't think like this? Because God does not control what you think or doesn't think. God does not control you. He never does. God does not control you. Because why would God control somebody? Makes no sense. Don't be so angry. Don't don't wish for the harm of innocent babies. Yeah, because yeah, because Babylon received the same treatment. Hell, Babylon killed babies in Israel. Babylon killed pregnant women and children in Israel. So the Israelites want to repay the same judgment towards Babylon too. They want to give Babylon the same treatment. And God, right, God allowed that to happen because people, God allowed the Israelites to be angry about it because one, the Israelites were, were what? They're, they're angry about it. And, and they have every right to be angry about the whole thing. So. No, this is, this is perfectly fine in God's eyes. Really? You know that later in the psalm that God basically condemned that later on. God condemned that part in psalm like, you know, what's, what's the psalm? Psalm, uh, psalm uh, 148. I think God probably condemned it later on somewhere in the Bible. I think God probably condemned it later on, so, yeah. Yeah, God probably condemned it later on, so that's one thing. And this is perfectly fine in the eyes of Christians today who defend it and justify it. Because people are fucking angry. If you're angry about what happened to you, same treatment, of course. Mm. And that was before Jesus was, was around. Israel was dark. But Jesus came and he said, turn the other cheek. Love those who hate you. Do good to your enemies. Because people are flawed. See, what she's confused about, about that the Bible's all about eternal morality. This woman's confused. Like, she's confused about the whole thing. Right? It talks about that this verse reflects the intense emotions and desire for justice felt by psalmist, but it is to important to interpret it within the context of psalm and historical situation rather than as command endorsement violence see people are flawed people are angry the israelites were angry about this and they are that they're angry they're angry about about the whole thing and they are it's not a moral thing to do god not agree with that in the bible god not agree with the whole thing but you know people are flawed the Bible isn't about just God. The Bible's about people, about how flawed we are. That is in complete contradiction with this verse. No, it's not, bro. God wasn't... F <laughs> the Bible, the psalm didn't say God was fine with it. Okay, the psalm talks about singing to God. The psalm talks about poetry, about the dark nature of humanity, what humans are capable of doing. I mean, does she even know what she's talking about? And these are God's people that are praying it. And God isn't... Con they didn't pray it. The Psalms about singing praises to God and also talking poetry of the dark nature of humanity. The Psalm is a song, not a prayer. You read the book of the Psalms, the Psalms, according to biblical theology, is a song, not a prayer. 
So, so the Jews are not praying to God for it. They're just angry about what happened to them. And they want Babylon to receive the same treatment that the Babylonians gave to them. This is, this is a song, not a prayer. What, what is she talking about? And I just have a very difficult time finding moral value in a book where the, the people of God, the people that are supposed to represent God in the book, are rejoicing over the thought of harming innocent babies. They're not rejoicing the thought of it. They're just angry and they want Babylon to receive the same treatment they received back then. People are vengeful. The Psalms talks about the dark nature of humanity, the nature of the human condition. Like the psalm is talking about the dark nature of humanity. The Babylon, they killed the women, they killed the children, they killed the men, and Israel won Babylon to receive the same treatment that Babylon gave to them. So, and God allowed that to be written there is because one, God wants the world to know the dark nature of humanity about the human condition. So that they didn't pray for it. The Psalms, it's just a song in the Bible. It wasn't a prayer, it's a song. Yeah. It's just a song. That's what it is. I mean, is she trying to plant, plant that on God, though? I don't get it. That doesn't make any sense to me, especially when you consider this is also the pro-life crowd. Yeah, and ironically, you also... A pro-choice. You want to murder innocent babies by killing them in the womb, right? You want to start bitching about God killing babies, but you're fine with it yourself. So what are you talking about? I'm, I like to basically Christy, Christy Berkey. You know better than God. I'm just saying. You know better than the Christian God <laughs> that you claim to accuse of. So what are you talking about? And I would imagine that Christians today don't feel that it is an appropriate thing to find joy in the thought of harming me. Because the Psalms was talking about Israel, not Christians. They want the treatment. Because if you read the verse in context, it's talking about, it, the AI says this, that lately in verse 9, the psalmist expressed a harsh sentiment wishing for the destruction of Babylon's children. This verse reflects the intense emotions and desire for justice felt by the psalmist, but it is important to interpret it within the context of the psalm and historical situation rather than as a command or endorsement of violence. So the psalm as a whole talks about the situation that Israel had went through and Israel want, wanted, read verse 8, right? It talks about that Verse expressed a desire for Babylon to represent it as a daughter of Babylon to be destroyed. The psalmist wishes for those who have oppressed them to receive the same treatment they have received. So that's what it's talking about here. So she thinks that this is some prayer or some moral endorsement to incite violence. No. The psalm is talking about the situation the Israelites are in and what the Israelites want to do. The psalm is not a prayer. It is a recording of the songs towards God, poetry towards God's creation, and the dark nature of humanity. That's the theme of the psalm itself. The psalm does not endorse violence or as a command. It's talking about this dark situation. This, this is what it's talking about here. I'll read again. Psalm 139, verse 19 is a passage from the book of Psalms in the Bible expressing the sorrow of the long of the Israelites who have been taken captive in exile in Babylon. The psalmist reflects on their pain and the desire to remember their homeland, Jerusalem. In verse 1, the psalmist describes the scene by the rivers of Babylon. They are set down, wept, and remembered Zion, Jerusalem. They were filled with sadness and longing with their homeland. Verse 2, they hung their harps upon the willows and the symbolizing their losses of joy in music. They were unable to find comfort or joy in their current situation. Verse 3 mentions how the captors demand them to sing the songs of Zion, mocking their pain and asking 
for entertainment. And the psalmist questions how they can sing the Lord's song in a foreign land where they have oppressed and far from their true home. In verse 5 and 6, the psalmist expresses their commitment to never forget get Jerusalem and they declare what is what if they forgot they forget they would rather lose their skills and abilities and right hand forget their cunning or unable to speak Jerusalem is valued above all else even their chief joy in verse 7 the psalmist calls upon the Lord to remember the actions of the Edomites who rejoiced the destruction of Israel they ask God to take their enemies actions and hold them accountable in verse 8 express the desire for Babylon to represent presented as the daughter of Babylon to be destroyed, and the psalmist wishes for those who have oppressed them to receive them the same treatment they have received. Lastly, in verse 9, the psalmist expresses a harsh sentiment wishing the destruction of the Babylon's children. This verse reflects the intense emotions and desire for justice felt by the psalmist. It is, But it is important to interpret within the context of the psalm and the historical situation rather than as command or endorsement of violence so she thinks that the psalm is saying that we should go kill children because you know you know this is like you know more for Christians to do so that's not what the psalm is saying the psalmist and the historical background is talking about what Israel want to do to the children and why will Israel want to do that because Babylon did the same thing to theirs. See, if you look at verse, verse 8, right? Right? If you read verse 8, it says, O dart of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, shall he be he that are worth thee as thou hast served us. Verse 8 says, verse 8 expresses a desire for Babylon, represented as the daughter of Babylon to be destroyed. The psalmist wishes for those who have oppressed them to receive the same treatment as they received. So the Babylonians and the Edomites, they've destroyed Israel. They've murdered the men, women, and children, and babies in Israel. And Israel wanted Babylon to receive the same treatment that they received back in their homeland. Because why? The Israelites wanted retribution, right? An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And why were they... Why were they think like that Paul well here's why because the Babylonians did the same thing to their people the Babylonians are wicked people and they are so I find it really interesting that because of the context or the time or just because it's in the Bible it is justifiable and I just don't find that to be justifiable by whose standard your standard Christy do you, have, do you have a standard? Do you have a high and mighty standard? Are you higher and mighty than everybody else? Killed your family. Do you want, if somebody else killed your family, do you want the same thing happen to their families? Of course you do. Why? Because you're vengeful like everybody else. You are no better than me and everybody else. You have a high and mighty standard, bro. The third passage that really just struck me, big red flags, popped up when I read it, um, was in Deuteronomy 22, starting in verse 28. No. If a man happens to meet a virgin who is not pledged to be married and he assaults her and they are discovered, he shall pay her father 50 shekels of silver. He must marry the young woman. Starting in the third passage that really just struck me, big red flags popped up when I read it, um, was in Deuteronomy 22. Starting in verse 28, if a man happens to meet a virgin who is not pledged to be married, force her as long as she lives. Now, when I read this in the earliest stages of my deconstruction journey. Uh, Deuteronomy 22. Okay, look at Deuteronomy 22. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 22. This is what she wants to read. Let's see. It says, Thou shalt see the brother's ox or a sheep go astray, hide thyself from him, and thou shalt in any case bring them again to thy brother. And if thy brother be not nigh unto thee, or if thou know him not, then thou shalt bring him unto thine own house, and if shall be unto thee until thy brother shall, shall, 
brother seek after it, and thou shalt restore it to him again. In that like manner thou shalt do as his with his ass, and shalt do with his remnant, and with all lost of his mother brothers, or thy brothers, which he hath lost, and thou hast found. Shalt thou do likewise, thou mayest deny, not hide thyself. Thou shalt not see thy brother's ox or his asses fall down by the way, and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt surely help him to lift him up again. The woman shall not wear which pertaineth to a man, neither shall pertaineth to a man put to a woman's garment, for all who do so abomination unto the Lord thy God. If thy, if a bird's nest chance unto before thee, thee in the way in any tree, or in the ground, whether they be young ones or eggs, or dams sitting upon the, the young, young, upon the eggs thou shalt take with the dam with the young, but thou shalt in any wise let the dam go, and take the young unto thee, that it may be well in with thee, and thou mayest prolong thy days. days. When thou dwellest a new house, then thou shalt make a battlement for thy roof, and thou bring for that for thou for that thou bring not blood upon thy house. If any man fall from thence, thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with divers, with divers seeds, lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown in the roof of thy vineyard be defiled. Thou shalt not plough into an ox and an ass together, which is an ass as a donkey, so I was talking about that. Thou shalt not wear a garment, garment of divers, sorts of woolen and linen together. Thou shalt, thou shalt make the fridges upon the floor, quarters with thy pastures, wherewith thou coverest thyself. If any make, if any man take a wife and go unto her and hate her, give the occasion to speak, give and give, and give occasions of speech against her and her bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman, and I, and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity, and virginity, virginity, and read the rest Jenny at the gate the damsel forever okay so what's she talking about me to marry the young woman for he has violated her if a man happens to meet a virgin who is not pledged to be married and he uh, 28. See, let's, let's, let's read the whole thing in context. Okay, so here's what it's talking about. So it says, in verse 20, sorry, in verse uh, 16 says, and the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hateth her. And lo, he hath given occasions of speech against her, and say, I found her not thy daughter or maid, yet these are tokens of my daughter's virginity. They shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city, and the elders of that city shall take the man and chastise him. And, and they shall amend immersed him into into hundred shekels of silver and gave them unto the father of the damsel because he hath brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel and she shall be his wife and he may not put her away in all his days but if this thing be true and the tokens of virginity not be found in for the damsel then they shall bring her out shall bring the damsel out of the door 
and her father's house and the men of her city and shall stone of her city and shall stone her with stones and she shall die because she hath brought a falling Israel to play the whore in the father's house so shalt thou put the evil way from among you if a man be found lying with a woman and married to an husband then they shall both then they shall both of them die both men and shall lay with woman and the woman men so so shalt thou put away evil from israel if damsel is a virgin and be betrothal betrothal unto an husband and the men find her in the city and lie with her verse 24 then ye sh shall bring them both out onto the gate of the city and ye shall stone them with the stones and they die the damsel because she cried not braiding being in the city and the man because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife so thou shalt put away evil from among you if a man find a thrall damsel in the field and the man force her and lie with her then the man only with the lay with her shall die but unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing for there is in the damsel no sin worthy of death for as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him so even so is the matter for he found her in the field, and betrothed, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there is none to save her. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay a hold on her, and lie with her, and they be found, then the man that layeth with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, that she shall be his wife, because he hath humbled her he may not put away put her away in all his days a man shall not take his father's wife nor discover the father's skirt so i don't i don't see the word rape in there she's talking about rape but i don't see that anywhere in the in the book of deuteronomy 20 and 22 all I see is just like adultery. It's like if you commit adultery, you get killed. But if you, I think adultery was a thing back then in Israel. I mean, the Israelites back then are, are fucked up. I mean, shit. I don't see the word rape in there. I don't see that. I don't see the word rape in there. All I see is just, you know, like safety precautions of what will happen. If someone commits adultery, so I don't think there's no rape. I don't think there's a rape in there. Assaults her as long as you know their father. Like there's there's no way the Bible says this. I need to figure this out. I contacted my old pastor and I um, you know, if a man did that to a woman, she would be considered unclean and not eligible. Not exactly. See, if a man did that to a woman, the man gets stoned to death. I think the Bible made it clear that if you if you try to throttle uh, the woman's uh, the woman right out of force and no one gets a chance to save her then um, then the woman is not considered as impure right but the man gets stoned to death so I mean that's what happens well, to be careful that makes sense the, oh, so when I got that answer from him it was not satisfactory the just not find a, a good justification for is in Deuteronomy 20 10 through 18 when you march up to attack a city make its people an offer of peace if they accept in Deuteronomy chapter 20 in Deuteronomy 20 it talks about that when thou goest to battle against thine enemies, seize horses and chariots and the people thou mourn, thou be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. It shall be as they come nigh unto the battle, and, and the priest shall approach and speak in, unto the people, and, and, shall, and shall say to them, 
Hear, O Israel, ye precious day in battle against your enemies. Let, let not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble, neither be ye terrified because of them. The Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for, for you against your enemies, to save you. The officer shall speak unto the people, saying, And what man is there that built a new house, and hath not decided, desitated? Let him go, and return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and other men decide to desate it. And the man what man is he that planteth a vineyard and hath not been eaten of it let him also go and return to his house unless he die in the battle and another another man eat of it and what man is there that hath bethrottled a wife and hath taken her let him go and return to his house lest he die in the battle and another man taketh her and the officers shall speak further unto the people and they shall say what man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted let him go and return to his house unless he he brethren's heart faint as well as his heart it shall be when the officers shall officers have made an ending an end of speaking unto the people and that they shall make captions and armies to lead the people. And when thou comest nigh unto the city, city, to fight against it and proclaim peace unto it, it shall be, if it bear answer to thee of peace, open unto thee, then it shall be that all of the people that are found therein shall be tribu tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. And if and if it all and if it will make no peace unto thee, but will make war against thee, then thou shalt besiege it. And when the Lord thy God hath delivered it unto thine hands, thou shalt smite every male thereof in the edge of the sword. But the woman and the little ones, and the cattle, and all in the city, even all the spoil thereof, Thou shalt take unto thyself. Thou shalt eat the spoil of thine enemies, which Lord thy God hath given thee. Thus thou shalt do all the cities, which are very far from thee, which are not of the cities of these nations, but of the cities of these people, which the Lord thy God hath given unto thee for inheritance. And thou shalt save, save alive nothing of the brother that breatheth. But... Thou shalt, uh, but thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Pezzarites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, thee, that they teach you not to, f not to do after all the abominations which they have done unto their gods. So, ye, sh so should ye sin against the Lord thy God, the Lord, Lord your God. When thou besieth a city a long time in making war against it to, to take it, thou shalt not destroy the trees thereof by forcing the axe against them, and thou mayest eat of them. Thou shalt not cut them down, for the trees of the field is man's life to employ them in the siege. Only the trees that knoweth that they be not trees for meat. Thou shalt destroy and cut them down, and thou shalt build bulwarks against the city and maketh war with thee, till, uh, until be subdued. So, so God ordered the men to be killed, but the women and children were safe because you look in the Bible, the Canaanites and the Hamorites and the Hizzites, they're not peaceful people, the wicked. And God told them that if you obey me, I'll give you peace. But they chose not peace, chose war. And that's when God decided to kill the men. But the women and the children uh, were saved and they were spared because they're kept in for, as citizens of Israel. So that's, that's a plus. 
and open their gates and peace to say, hey, you know, we're, we're, we're giving you a peace offering. Would you like to make peace with us? And if that city agrees to being peaceful with you, you are to capture them and enslave them. No. No, it's that's not peaceful, bro. That's not what the Bible is saying. He's saying be, enslave them. Them because the because the the Hittites and the Amorites are not are not peaceful people. They're evil. Those people in those cities are evil and wicked people, and they are so they're evil. Right. You are to force them to work for you to be your slaves. It didn't, doesn't say that. It says forced labor. Let's, let's, see, let's so, see what she says. On when the verse 18, it says, If they teach you not to do after all their abominations, which they have done unto their gods, so should you sin against the Lord your God? Lord your God. Let's look at verse 10. So I look at verse 10 to uh, I deliver to verse 10 to verse 15. All right, see what it says. It says, When thou comest nigh unto the city, to the city to fight against it, and proclaim peace unto it, and it shall be, if it make thee answer of peace, then open unto thee, and it shall be, that all the people that's found them thereof shall be tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. And if it will make no peace unto thee, but will make war against thee, then thou shalt besiege it. And when the Lord thy God hath delivered unto thine hands, thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword, but the woman and the little children and the cattle, all that's in the city, even all the spoil thereof, shalt thou take unto thyself and thou shalt eat of the spoil of thy enemies which the lord thy god hath given unto thee thus thou shalt do all the cities which are very fair from thee far from thee which are not the cities of these nations so god said to the people that they accept peace they shall be accepted as tributaries as representations of the israelites a tributary is a person or a city that represents a nation like uh like nato represents america they're tributary towards the american people right or hawaii or hawaii or any other nation that represents a nation so god said if they make peace unto thee right if god says they make what god says they make peace Onto thee, P, they shall serve as tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. So, if you look at America, right, all the products that we got from, like, all the food we got comes from other foreign nations, Turkey and rest, right? They're served as tributaries. The four nations serve America, right? That's what it is. Same goes for these cities. The cities make peace and accept unto thee and choose not to fight you. And guess what happens? They shall serve as tributaries, as representations of Israel. Right? But if they, so here's what the verse says again. What's that? It says, it says this. It says, when thou comest nigh unto city to fight against it, and proclaim it peace unto it, and it shall be. If it make peace, if they make the answer of peace and open unto thee, then it shall be. All that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. So I don't see anywhere talks about forced labor. I don't see. She says it talks about forced labor but I don't see it there so there and if will if it will not make peace if it will make no peace unto thee 
but will make war against the Udesh procedure. So, and what it says, it says, but one of the little ones shall be cattle and city shall. So these, so the females and the and children were spared, right? They were spared from destruction, but the males were killed, right? The males were killed. And God said that if the city makes peace onto you and they chose to negotiate, then, you know, they shall work for you and you work with them. That way they'll become better, right? But if the city, right, chose to make war against thee, make war against it and kill only the men, but the women and the children shall be spared. So that's, that's, that's not vindictive. It sounds like a good thing because... If a city chose to make peace with you guys, that's a good thing. Because why? You can have supplies, resources, all these things you have in the world, right? Like, Israel will make peace with you. If if you do it, then Israel can give you all the supplies you need, right? Like food, incense, oil, everything. That's how you make a city and nation in terms of uh, progress. But if a city chose to make war against you, then you had to go war against it. So, so God says don't make don't wage war unless... They chose to attack you, right? And the woman and children, right? They were spared from the destruction, so they're they're okay. So use it into your hand and peace to say, hey, you know, we're 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 giving you a peace offering. Would you like to make peace with us? And if that city agrees to being peaceful with you, you are to capture them and enslave them. That's not what the Bible says. It says they shall serve as tributaries. It says it shall be if they make if they if it make the answer of peace and open unto thee, then it shall be, and that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. I don't see anywhere talks about forced labor. I don't see that anywhere. I don't see anything about forced labor. I don't see that. You are to force them to work for you, to be your slaves. So so right here, right on in the very beginning, it, it's it's saying to harm people that are peaceful with you. It's not what it's saying. It's saying if they're peaceful towards you, that they shall serve thee as tributaries, as they shall they shall what? They shall be work partners. Like if if a city makes peace with a nation, that those two nations will be obligated to work together. That's what the verse is saying. It's saying that 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 it shall be if it make answer peace and open unto thee, then it shall be it shall be and it shall sorry. It shall be if the if it make the answer of peace and open unto thee, then it shall be and all the people that are found in therein shall be tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. So what is it saying? It's saying that if they negotiate with you, they shall give you some people to work for you and uh, pay back the debt. Same goes for in Israel, right? See, every nation, right? The Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, and the Pezzites, and Hivites, and Drusites are all Hebrew. Hebrew is what? a Not a language. It is a region where all the Near Eastern the near Middle Eastern peoples are connected, right? The Muslims are considered Hebrew. Egyptians are considered Hebrew. Every single nation that's around Israel is considered as Hebrew, as partners, right? Are not foreign nations, and they're not, right? And that's that's what it is. So God's saying that if you make peace with Israel, then guess what happens? Israel shall work with you, work for you. Right, and in return, you work for them for money, supplies, food, negotiation, all these things. Right, that's how nations are built according to history. Nations are built how by negotiation and working together in international nice warfare. So I don't see what she's getting to to force them to work for you to enslave them. This is it's not what it says. God specifically endorsing and commanding you to enslave other people. That's not what that's not what God's saying. God says if they make peace unto thee, then they shall be served as tributaries and shall serve thee. Right? How they serve thee? By helping Israel grow as a nation. Yeah. Grow as a nation. That's how nations are built in reality. Right? God's a legalist. 
Okay, every law that God makes on earth is not eternal because some laws take place in different historical situations where things are applied to this to there. Right? Even if they're peaceful. They're not even peaceful. I can appreciate this as a book that is a commentary on the Bible. But about Hill, he was high in here. <laughs> Christians believe that Jesus was God. Jesus is God. And so when it says he gave up his only son, well, he's God. It's not his son, it's him. He gave up himself. Okay, so he gave up himself. Does he know what the Trinity is? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are not the same person, but they make themselves known as God Almighty. The Bible says in the book of in, in the book of John says that for God so the world that he gave his only God's son Jesus Christ. Though our belief on him should not perish have blessed in life. Hell, back in the beginning, the angel of Yahweh, who was God, wasn't called Jesus. He was called the Logos. He was called the Word. Yep. And he was given the name of Jesus when he arrived on earth as God saves. See, every name that people have, because there's power like Methuselah, right? Methuselah, in the Bible, embodies the, the coming of the flood. Methuselah, who is the great-grandfather of Noah, means bring forth the death. Every name has a message, a theme, a message towards humanity. Jesus wasn't called Jesus, okay? He was called the Logos, right? In the Bible, Jesus was called the Logos. He was called the Word. Read the book of John, right? Read the book of John, chapter 1, verse 1 says, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, which was with God. The same as in the beginning with God, all things made by him through him, without him, Nothing that is made, that is made. In him was life, and life that is life meant. And life shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehended not. For a, for a man sent from God, whose name was John, and the same came from a whiteness to bear witness to all of, of light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear the witness of the light. And, the, and that was the true light that lieth every man that comes to the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came on to his own, and his own received him not. But as many have received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, God, even to them that believe in his name, which, which are born not of blood, but of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of the flesh, but nor of the will of man, but of God. And the world was made flesh that dwelt among us, and was withheld, was beheld his glory and the glorious that his only begotten of the father full of grace and truth john was unto him and cried and saying to him whom i spoke he came on to after me and preferred before me for for before he was before me before me so you see what i'm saying saying Jesus, right, he held the Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit, right? And the second person of Trinity wasn't called Jesus, called the Logos. He was called the Word. And when the Word became flesh, that's when the name called Jesus came over here. That's the Trinity, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. But why did he have to do that? Called double jeopardy. If, if a man commits a crime, and if that other person says, hey, judge, I'm going to pay for the penalty the man deserved, then guess what happens? The man... Who, who decide to take the blame of the criminal, right? Right? The criminal gets scot-free, they get rehabilitated to become better, while the man volunteered to pay for the man's sentence. That's called double jeopardy. That's how America works. That same goes for in Korea, same goes for, uh, for um, in any other country. Double jeopardy works for society. What was the point? In my last video, the manipulation of the crucifixion, um, we talked about that, about how he never had to do that. He was never obligated to die or to put on this big death display in order to guilt humanity into... He doesn't do that to guilt humanity. God did that to save us. Jesus, according to Christianity, right? He came down to earth as a man to live and preach the word of God and die for humanity so all might be saved that way we can all gain grace by god the bible says 
Belief on him shall be saved. By faith alone. The Bible talks about this. Right? Jesus did that because why? He loved us. He didn't do it because he wants to guilt us. He did this because he loved us. Saying, because he loved us. He did it out of love, not out of hatred. So Jesus didn't do that to guilt trip anybody. He did that because he loved us. Here, here's a video that I'm going to show you. His name uh, is Safe Skeptic. He's going to show you what's going on. When you're struggling with porn addiction and you don't know where to turn or not only from biblical sources that the world back then was much more evil than it is today a little disingenuous i mean if she is so disgusted by the raw emotion toward the infants in this poem you'd think she would be adamantly pro-life but it doesn't seem to be that way which is something i'll dig into in a second because it reveals the real reason i believe she left christianity but first i have to make this point it's only the people who live in relatively peaceful circumstances who have the luxury of being quote turned off by such stories was christie's nation exiled from its land was she forced into torture and, and by the way there's a man named call safe skeptic he's gonna explain the whole thing to you guys so He's going to explain to you guys right now. You guys can watch him. Slavery? Probably not. So she shouldn't condemn those who experienced life like this and therefore spoke in this manner. Nor should she condemn God for allowing this pure emotion to be included in the Bible. When it comes to Bible interpretations, the number one rule is to not isolate a passage on its own, but pull together the entire context of the Bible. If she did that, then she'd see that God already condemns this sort of talk. Now, this is not to insult her, but... She is able to make these arguments from the comfort of her home, with her makeup and hair kept nice while broadcasting from her personal computer, largely because of what the Christian worldview has given to our society, to her. Without Christianity, we'd still be living in the Dark Ages. It is Christianity that argued for human dignity, that all people were made in the image of God and deserve respect. She is figuratively standing on the shoulders of Christianity to tear it down. I mean, just look at how Christianity spread throughout the entire world and affected change. When it comes to hospitals, education, science, human dignity, justice, mercy, and forgiveness... And think about how it is all part of every aspect of our lives and how all of these are rooted in her argument. She's using the values of the Bible to tear down the Bible. How insane is that? Fourth passage that I had a really difficult time with that I still cannot find a, a good justification for is in Deuteronomy 20, 10 through 18. When you march up to attack a city, make its people an offer of peace. If they accept and open their gates, all the people in it shall be subject to forced labor and shall work for you. If they refuse to make peace and they engage you in battle, lay siege to the city. When the Lord your God delivers it into your hand, put to sword all the men in it. As for the women, the children, the livestock, and everything else in the city, you may take these as plunder for yourselves. And you may use the plunder your Lord, the Lord your God gives you from your enemies. This is how you are to treat all cities that are at a distance from you and do not belong to the nations nearby. So God is commanding his people to go around to all the neighboring cities to offer them peace. And if that city agrees to being peaceful with you, you are to capture them and enslave them. So right here, right on in the very beginning, it's saying to harm people that are peaceful, to force them to work for you, to enslave them. This is God specifically endorsing and commanding you to enslave other people. Then it says, if they are not peaceful, then you are to just kill them all and then take the women and children as plunder and do whatever with the plunder that you want to do those are the spoils of your war what do you think that means good question based on the whole of the bible it probably means that god is advancing his kingdom in a ruthless godless world but history and context matter first of all she says that these people were peaceful where does it say that all it says is that if they choose peace then their lives will be spared but these nations were anything but peaceful. In fact, we know, not only from biblical sources, that the world back then was much more evil than it is today. Evil had risen to unprecedented heights. You may recall in Genesis when God divided the nations at the Tower of Babel. Evil had risen so much that God, instead of rightfully destroying them right then and there, he disinherited the nations and gave them over to their desires, assigning the sons of God, or angels, to rule over them. The people of those nations, however, began to worship the sons of God instead of God, and idol worship spread throughout the land. 
And regarding the idols, it should be noted that the Canaanite men and women sacrificed their children to these idols. It has also been put forth by many scholars that the Canaanite culture were descendants of the giants mentioned in Genesis 6, who many believe were the children of the fallen angels who cohabitated with human women to create these giants. If you can believe that Jesus rose from the dead, then it wouldn't be difficult to believe that these Canaanite people and the surrounding nations could have been descendants of the Nephilim and were utterly evil. By taking the women and children from these evil men, God was saving them from further sin and corruption. Not only that, the nations were a threat to Israel, and God actually gave these nations plenty of warning to turn away from their evil, and they refused. God then ordered the destruction of the Canaanites because of the corrupting influence they would have if their false religious system was allowed to survive. Unfortunately, Israel disobeyed God and did not utterly destroy these pagan peoples. This disobedience eventually led to their own captivity. In fact, we see many times that Israel did not obey God and he brought about judgment on them, using other nations to do so. No, that's, no, that's correct. No, that's correct. Thanks. So, but I don't hear Christy complaining about those instances. My point is, there are many solutions to her issues with the Bible, but she chose the one solution that has her abandoning her faith altogether. The one solution that says the Bible was written to oppress society. The hard truth of the Bible is that people who reject God and harm other people will eventually receive punishment from God. It is God who decides our every breath. Millions of people die every year, so does Christy have an issue with God for ending their lives? Now, I'm not going to try and psychoanalyze her, but from what she said, it sounds more to me like she believes people are inherently good and don't deserve punishment from God. She has too high of a view of mankind and too low a view of God's holiness. What do I mean? Look around at all the beauty and goodness of this world. It all comes from God. What would humans be like without the goodness of God and his grace? What would be left? Evil and chaos. I think she's conflating the goodness she sees within people as being inherent to those people. But rather, according to the Bible, any goodness from anyone comes from God. It is God's common grace that allows this world to exist with any order at all. So when she shakes her fist up at God for punishing humans, she's using the very good rationality that God gave her to tell him he's wrong. Yet perhaps her understanding of God is wrong and she's not giving him the credit he deserves when she comes across questionable passages. Finally, I will briefly touch on her next take. And the last verse that I want to bring up is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave up his only son. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have everlasting life. Let's break it down just a little bit. Let's deconstruct John 3.16. For God so loved you they want it. Yes, God does love the world as he's the sole sustainer of it. It is all his creation and it all obeys his command from the smallest atoms to the largest of galaxies. They all work according to his goodwill. Everything she feels about God's morality is evidence of God's goodness. She, being made in the image of God, has a morality based on who God is. The only difference is she cannot see God's plan. Plus, having a sinful nature that blurs the truth, she sees God as evil, which is an absurd thought in and of itself, because if God were evil in any way, he wouldn't be God. She claims God didn't love the Canaanites and cities that he judged, but it was his love that caused him to intervene and judge those people groups. His loving decision to destroy their evil culture prevented them from continuing in evil and building up wrath. Think of all the millions of people in countless generations who were saved from satanic paganism because God either ended those civilizations or turned them to himself with the help of his people. God so loved the world, okay, that he gave up his only son. Now this is loaded because it's a son, but it's also him, depending upon what you believe or which the nomination you're a part of or even which time frame you came out of because in the very earliest days people did not believe that jesus was god this is flat out false if you read the scriptures you'll see that the earliest of christians including the apostles all believed jesus was god this comment by her makes me feel like she's not being entirely upfront about her christianity because the new testament is clear on jesus's divinity but, but modern christians believe that jesus was god jesus is god and so when it says he gave up his only son well he's god it's not his son it's him he gave up himself okay so he gave up himself but why did he have to do that he never had to do that he was never obligated to die or to put on this big death display in order to guilt humanity into believing in him or following him or whatever that was never a requirement of him he 
chose that. He made the rules. He decided that blood needed to be shed in order for humanity to be forgiven. He couldn't have just decided to forgive them. That would be silly, right? So his choice to give up well, this his is, life. I mean, that's why I explain. It's called double jeopardy. If I decide to suffer the, suffer the death penalty or take a sense of a serial killer or anybody else, then that's just. Why? Because the judge has to put his wrath upon somebody, right? Jesus willingly offered his life for as a ransom for our sins. He did that not out of guilt tripping us. He did that out of love. Like, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. But in Christianity, Jesus didn't do that to guilt trip anybody. He did that to save humanity. He did it out of love, not out of hate. So why, why, so why would, um, like the question is, why would she say that God did that to guilt trip humanity? But it clearly says in the gospel that the Bible says that those who believe on him will never die, but have everlasting life. Jesus didn't do that out of guilt trip. People did it out of because he loved you. Like, I don't believe in God or a deity, and I don't. But the Bible said, made it clear that the Bible made it clear that Jesus did that out of love, not out of hatred. So, you know what I'm saying? Did out of love. So, I'm just telling the truth what the Bible is talking about here. Unlike her, she just, she, just, she just kept on lying 24-7, day in, day out. That was entirely his choice, and it was unnecessary. It was only made necessary because he decided it was necessary. So, it's really not that much of a gift. It's not that much of a display. There again, it's called double jeopardy. Further enforce my point. Way of love when it was never necessary to begin with. Is it justice to turn the other way when somebody does something wrong? I don't think so. And God being fully just couldn't do that. It's easy for you as a human being to maybe look the other way when somebody does something wrong, but not God. He found a way to forgive us of our sin while maintaining his perfect justice and perfect love all at the same time. That is where we get the cross. And that is why God had to do something about our sin. God did not arbitrarily invent the rules. The rules are inherently and inextricably attached to his nature. As a perfectly holy being, God cannot be in the presence of sin without being revolted by it and desiring to be separate from it. As a perfectly just being, God cannot allow evil to go unjudged and unpunished. Further, all sin is ultimately committed against God, who is infinite and eternal. So only an eternal separation from him is a just penalty. God could not change this requirement as he himself is unchanging and unchangeable. Even if God wanted to declare some other means to be sufficient for salvation, his holiness, his justice, and immutability would prevent him from doing anything other than what he's already declared. And what he has declared must be perfectly aligned with the essence of who he is. That's, that's not even the worst part. The worst part to me is the end of the verse where it says, Whosoever believes shall have eternal life and not perish whosoever believes so right here the bible is telling us the measure for is the do it wouldn't even have the choice to be with god because she would have lost her so-called ticket to salvation the moment she decided to tell her first lie or disobey her parents this is why the message of the gospel is so amazing because in our sinful state we are already condemned but it is god who rescues us from this condemnation all we have to do is accept his invitation Unfortunately, however, there are many who don't want this relationship with God and would rather live apart. And by the way, if you hear this voice, it was my roommate talking. Sorry. I got a job working at Amazon, so I got a roommate. Sorry. And belief in God and the gospel is the only way we can truly understand who God is and what he's done for us. Belief in him. But what they don't realize is that there is no other logical path toward life. Living separate from God is not an option because God is the sustainer of life. Which brings me to my an emotional response and has nothing to do with the village. You see, there's a self-righteous attitude that I see with many deconversionists and it can appear in the way they speak to you, smiling at you like you're a child. See, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God or a deity, but these, and same skeptic, he's right. Many of these atheists... People like Aaron Ra, Matt DeWante, Tracy Harris, all these people, right? They got like a like a self-righteous attitude. They got pride. 
I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. I left Christianity for emotional reasons. I'm not self-righteous. But I had to be real. Like, these people claim to speak for my community. I'm an atheist. Okay, I want no part in a war against religion. I don't. But atheist apologists like her and Matt DeWante and all these other atheist apologetics, they want to drag me into a war against religion that I want no, that I want no part in. But this is what the fuck happens. If you drag me into a war against religion, I'm going to side against you. And that's what happens. So... As an atheist, I'll make it clear. If you're an atheist apologetic and you're watching this video, leave us the fuck alone. We don't want no part in no war against religion, okay? That's a fact. If you side against me, if you, side, if you try to force me to side against religion, well, sorry, I'm going to side against you. That's me. But Save the Skeptic did a good job making this video. I'm going to post my video on the YouTube channel and uh, post the link to your video. I'm going to copy the link to my clipboard. That way everyone can watch your video. You know what I'm saying? So save skeptic and watch this video. I'm going to share this video to you and stuff. And uh, that, that that can be it. So I'm a, a, a thanks save skeptic for the video. And as an atheist, I'm a big fan of your YouTube channel. You did a good job. So thank you. And that could be it. Everybody, goodbye. I love you guys. And that could be it. So, uh, goodbye. Thank you.